morning or or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're calling in from. Thank you for calling into the uh, PCDC and Advocates for Human Potential webinar on making the American Rescue Plan funding work for your organization's strategic plan. Today, we're gonna talk about really how to leverage the funding that's all become recently available for FQHCs and lookalike and how we can help you, um, you know, organize your response to HRSA in the upcoming weeks for the various funding opportunities, and then help you really organize your implementation and rollout of those funds over the next two to three years. Um, Mike, can you go to the next slide? Just to note, so the session's being recorded. Uh, the recording slides and related materials will be made available on the Primary Care Development Corporation and the Advocates for Human Potential uh, websites as a follow-up. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please ask them in the Q&A function and we will follow up, but we'll also leave time at the end for open Q&A, um, but we'll, we'll work our way through it as we go. Next slide. Just by introduction, I'm Isaac Kastenbaum. I'm the Vice President for PCDC's Training and Technical Assistance Services. Bonnie? I'm Bonnie Brownlee, Senior Consultant in the Healthcare uh, Solutions Division of Advocates for Human Potential, longtime advisor and consultant to FQHCs. All right. And uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. I'm Patrick Gautier, the Director of Healthcare Solutions at AHP, and delighted to be here with you today. Good morning, happy uh, Monday morning, if there is such a thing to everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, David Desai Ramirez, I'm the Senior Director and Western Region Market Lead for PCDC. Next slide, thank you everyone. Uh, so just about Primary Care Development Corporation, so we're about a 30 year old national nonprofit, wholly committed to achieving health equity through the expansion of primary care. We do that through uh, capital investment, providing training and technical assistance and advisory services, conducting research and evaluations on primary care, and also advocacy at the state and federal level. Next slide. All right, and Advocates for Human Potential uh, is uh, about 35 years old now, um, 35th year. And uh, we were founded to improve health and human services, uh, particularly from a system of care standpoint. And you know, our mission is to help organizations like yours and the people you serve reach their full potential. Uh, we're now about 120 people around the country working with organizations like yours and a lot of history working with uh, directly with the federal agencies like HRSA and SAMHSA and others and states and provider organizations. We provide consulting services, training, technical assistance, research and evaluation, as well as the logistical and technology support for conferences and summits and even meetings like these. And um, we truly hope to help our clients master what they've got on their plate so that they can deliver the very best to the people they serve. Next slide. And so just for an agenda today, so we're gonna do a quick overview of the funding opportunities that are currently out there from HRSA and other agencies. We'll talk about how to organize your planning efforts, both you know in anticipation of submitting your applications and in follow-up and implementation. We'll talk about a few areas of innovation that you might consider uh, as you're awarded your funds and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Next slide. So just to do a quick overview, there are several concurrent funding sources that are available right now to FQHCs and to lookalike organizations. So just working from left to le left to right, there's the H8F program, which is uh, funding for operation support for FQHCs. There's its complementary program for lookalikes um, for operational support. There is a capital and construction improvement grant program for FQHCs. Uh, the FCC monies that have been made available for telehealth investments 
And then there's a new grant from HRSA on optimizing virtual care. Um, Mike, can you, next slide. So just to put them all up against each other, they're, they're uh, similar in scope and function, but they have interesting nuances between them and all have different timelines for submission, uh, programmatic timelines for when you can use the funds and, and different methods for submission. So again, starting from the left, the FQHC dollars, the H8E, only available for federally qualified health centers. Your application or really work plan for those is due a week from today via the HRSA electronic handbook process. It's two years of funding and it can be used broadly uh, for operational support and investments uh, related to expanding your COVID-19 capacity as well as recovering and stabilizing from the pandemic. The lookalike funding, very similar scope. Uh, those applications were due via grants.gov about two weeks ago on the 14th, and they have a two-year run rate for a two-year period from July um, of 2021 to June of 2023. You then have the capital and construction program for FQHCs. Those applications are due on June 24th, again, via the HRSA electronic handbook process. It's a three-year period from this fall to the fall of 2024, with a real focus again on building capacity um, at your FQHC. And it has to really be related uh, to providing services within the health center program scope. The next was the FCC telehealth, really round two. There was an earlier round in 2020. This is to cover purchases made throughout the pandemic related to telehealth, and it's a direct reimbursement program. It's not so much a grant. You, you submit for approval, and then you submit your receipts or invoices for payment or reimbursement from the FCC as you go. And then the last is a recently released grant from HRSA for FQHCs, and it's about 25 total FQHCs across the country, really focusing on taking your virtual care to the next level and how you can make it a long-term, high-impact, sustainable program. Uh, those are due in mid-July, and again, it, it's about a two-year program starting about a, a year from now and continuing into 2024. All of the programs have the links at the bottom. If you have any questions, you can follow up with us, and we'll make sure to address them or, or funnel you to the right people at HRSA or NAC or, or other agencies. Next slide, please. I'm now going to hand it off to Bonnie to talk about a a good process of organizing yourself for your application and for the ongoing implementation work. Bonnie? We hope you'll find it a good process anyway. Um, as these new funding streams became available and were announced in rapid succession, we thought, uh, how are health centers going to get organized around this? This is pretty overwhelming. So we started to pencil out some tools and decided that maybe these would actually be useful to you in getting organized around um, project selection and how to spend the money. Next slide, please. We know that your health centers have been overwhelmed in this past year as the pandemic unfolded and uh, you've been in full reactive mode. Well, now with a new infusion of money, um, it's really a great time to sit back, rethink, plan, and in some cases, reboot <clears throat> your services. Um, this new funding has a short two to three year time span. And uh, I think a careful strategy will really help you leverage the funding that's now available so you can achieve your goals. Next slide, please. I suspect that all of you on the call today, or most of you have dug into the paperwork around these different funding streams. This is the um, H8F layout uh, from HRSA. <clears throat> You'll notice that there are nine different service or, or programming categories that are eligible for the funding um, and can be applied across four different domains. Two of these domains are directly COVID service related. That's vaccine administration and the COVID-19 response and care. The other two really encourage a long view of what's going to become your new normal. Um, three of the categories of focus are administrative, strategic planning, 
workforce uh, training and education and capital investment, and the remainder are directly service related. Next slide, please. We've developed for you a few tools that will help you with planning, and these are laid out in three simple steps. Um, Self-assessment, prioritization, and action planning to identify key milestones, dependencies, resources to achieve your intended outcomes. I would like to note that the self-assessment tool can actually help you understand your uh, current state of operations, your current positioning for um, new programs and can help you with your applications for these fundings, as well as getting organized around a longitudinal plan. Next slide, please. As Isaac said earlier, as a participant today, you're going to receive a packet that will include these planning tools and worksheets. And I want to take a few minutes and walk you through a tutorial on how to use them. Next slide, please. First, the self-assessment tool. As you look at the, the way this is laid out, you'll note that the uh, domains are displayed in the far left column, the four domains that HRSA has um, indicated, and the categories of programming are displayed across the top. Um, as you use this tool, you will score yourself from one to five, with five being the highest level of maturity, one meaning we've barely got this uh, in motion at this time. Um, so you'll rank yourself according to your level of competency. You should also use this tool to annotate your thoughts about specific things that you would do in each domain. So as we look at this scenario, um, across the first row for vaccine administration. I've um, taken a uh, Phantom Health Center and uh, scored at fives across the first few categories that for vaccine administration, strategic planning uh, is in place. Our staff have been trained and educated about what we're doing and why um, we're successful with our patient outreach and we've uh, provided enough access points to adequately meet the community need. Um, but we're falling down in the areas of care coordination and um, understanding our priority populations and using social determinants of health. This would point to the need for some risk stratification tools. In the second um, row under COVID response, we're doing fine for the moment, but we really haven't given much thought to what's gonna to happen to our patients who are affected by long COVID syndrome. So we need some protocols to be put in place. We've got weaknesses here um, in the strategy and planning workforce training areas. And also a risk, uh, a risk stratification is identified as a weakness. Also, as we look at care coordination options and social determinants. Our telehealth in this area is weak and certainly could use some fortification. In the next category, maintaining and increasing capacity, we've got some weaknesses around planning. Obviously, we need to put our heads together and do some work here. And our thoughts initially move to developing our care management program. We've got some basic things in place, but really do need to give some good thought to this and fully develop it. And then recovery and stabilization, who doesn't need things in every single one of these categories across the board. Um, as you look at the telehealth column, you'll notice the, the green portion on this, what I call splat mat. Um, we need a full reset. We know that health centers across the board have been um, very reactionary in putting together a telehealth program. It may not be smooth, but it's doing its job today. Let's take some time and rethink it and do a full reset on our telehealth services, including a business plan around that and how we apply uh, perhaps a hybrid service delivery model in the future. In the capital investment column to the far right of this tool, you'll see we've penciled in some concepts around maybe a mobile clinic would help us with our COVID response, um, our uh, capacity uh, to serve our patients and so forth. We know we need a telehealth platform that's um, more stable than the one we've been using, and we don't have a proper analytics tool to help us with 
risk stratification and understanding social determinants of our various populations. We obviously need some space planning um, to occur to support the build out of our care coordination team and to more adequately um, uh, launch our new telehealth uh, modality. Next slide, please. From the self-assessment tool, you can move into this prioritization matrix um, by applying the scores and descriptors from the self-assessment worksheet. If you look at this, the way this is laid out, there are four different quadrants. Um, the, first, uh, the first row, you would enter your high maturity scores anywhere that you've assessed yourself at a level four or five on the first row using the first column for um, to indicate items that require few resources or would be of low cost to the organization to implement. In the second column, you would enter anything that required a higher level of resources and a high cost. So this then becomes your decision matrix. So from the self-assessment tool, um, we've entered fives here for a variety of things. And that means we have all of these things covered. We're fine. Um, don't need additional resources thrown at these particular areas. Dropping down to the um, bottom row where we have low maturity scores of one, two, or three, we've entered a few things here. Um, these, this would indicate that we can do this by ourselves, we think, but we might need some additional resources. So in COVID response, we had um, scored ourselves for uh, a level two for planning, training, and outreach for our long COVID syndrome protocols. Um, we've given ourselves a three for HIE implementation in COVID response capacity and um, recovery stabilization areas. A three was also noted for capital investments um, uh, for care management and telehealth, the analytics tools on the telehealth platform. We might be able to figure out uh, on our own how to um, select and acquire these items, but we might need help there as well. And the last item in this category is the capital investment for um, care management as well. So looking at the lower right column, you see most of our items from the self-assessment tool are displayed here. And these are areas where we know that we're going to need extra help in a variety of capacities. So with vaccine administration, care coordination, and social determinants of health, that risk stratification effort um, is something that really needs uh, another set of hands and eyes on. COVID response, care coordination, social determinants of health, you can see a theme going on here. Um, capacity, capital investment, we need some help with that. Um, uh, recovery and stabilization, how to regroup our telehealth protocols and develop a business plan for a hybrid, hybrid care delivery model. So that's how this prioritization matrix unfolds. Next slide, please. From our priorities list, we can um, then pick up this action planning tool and uh, put together a descriptor of action steps, milestones, responsibilities for each specific project we'd like to undertake. So you can see the top of this screen has been filled in with project descriptors, develop the care management program that falls into the maintaining and increasing capacity domain. Um, under care coordination transitions and includes a capital investment overlay. So I've just uh, inserted a few milestones here, hire an RN uh, care manager, um, develop a risk stratification method. Uh, let's see what else is on here. Um, develop a liaison with the local hospital. This is for transitions of care and then some space planning concerns. And you can see across the board that um, dependencies have been identified, what, what resources are required, our source of funding is noted here, and then any barriers or concerns are also documented on this worksheet. 
as you begin to use this worksheet, you may need to expand it to larger than letter size because there are a lot of columns here. And I know that um, you probably will have a lot of notes. So that in a very whirlwind kind of snapshot um, is a layout of the three planning tools that we've provided or that we've developed and we think will um, be useful to you and your health centers. Next slide, please. I'll turn it over to Patrick now. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead on to the, the next slide, if you would, as we uh, wanted to point out just a few uh, areas, I'll cover a couple of them, that we think might benefit from a uh, real concentrated effort, given the opportunity and the funding uh, sources, the variety of funding sources. And you've heard reference to it uh, several times already, telehealth. Uh, we really believe this is an area that uh, is gonna require some uh, capacity building, some competency building, some workforce development, uh, if you will. Uh, you heard Bonnie refer to hybrid uh, sort of models of care. And I think there's, there may even be more to it than that. You know, I think we're all in the business of trying to maintain uh, fidelity to evidence-based practices. And what happens to our evidence-based practices when we begin to practice them on a telehealth platform and when we begin to practice them in a hybrid kind of way. So it, it I think begs the question, you know, who benefits from a hybrid approach, uh, is it all patients or are there certain uh, groups within my patient population that are really gonna benefit and under what circumstances? How do we help them close the digital divide? Is there something that we can do with some of this funding to supply tablets or Wi-Fi uh, and so forth? And, and how will we know when our uh, approach to uh, telehealth is or isn't working from quality indicators from outcomes, uh, kinds of indicators. What kinds of training do we need to provide our clinical staff as it relates to communicating on a digital platform for the long term? Uh, you know, I think you've, you've heard it said now a few times, we did everything we could, we reacted, and I think we reacted brilliantly across the country in, in a, adapting adopting telehealth, but where do we go from here? And will the billing and reimbursement continue to support these efforts? Uh, is there anything about our technology, uh, you know, were we to continue uh, the way that we are that could help us gather the kinds of data that we need to evidence our outcomes and quality? Is there any integration with uh, our other IT that we should prioritize. So these are the kinds of things, whether it's workforce development, uh, the data uh, and technology dimension uh, that we want you to be considering as you look at your plans moving forward. And we'll go to the next slide. And here we wanted to talk about the other thing you heard, Bonnie, uh, uh, highlighting, which is care coordination and how important that was before the pandemic and how important it is as we move forward. And here, <clears throat> you know, we first of all wanna highlight that there are different elements of a comprehensive care management program. There's the care coordination, there's chronic care management, and then there are transitions in care. And to the extent that this is an opportunity for you to really reinforce what you're doing uh, to add certain elements that you haven't had the time or the bandwidth uh, to add, the, uh, the staffing levels that might be needed to support some of these, the facilities and infrastructure that might be needed to support some of these. Now's the time to be thinking about that. Um, some of the questions uh, that we've laid out here, I'm not going to read them all to you, but they certainly can help uh, you better understand where you are where you'd like to be in relationship to care coordination. And especially, uh, I think I wanna put a plug in here for the complexity uh, of behavioral health 
interactions with medical conditions. You know, we work with a lot of integrated and organized systems of care, and they've really made a point in this last year or two uh, to build out their capacity to work with uh, multiple chronic conditions, including chronic addiction. Uh, and that's an area in regard to care coordination that they wanted to reinforce and add some skills, develop workforce uh, skills in that area to be able to deal with those thorny issues. And I think the other is social uh, determinants of health or uh, health related social needs. There are a number of implications there for workforce development, for building a, a system in your own community of partners and, and different relationships and also for acquiring some software. Uh, there are some wonderful software solutions that are helping people address the social dimension of the population they serve. So all kinds of questions that we wanted to share with you to get you thinking about what you might do to, again, expand, enhance, improve in this vital area of care coordination, uh, especially as it relates to uh, the people who are doing the work of the work and, and what kinds of additional skill sets might they need in the form of trauma-informed care, uh, motivational interviewing, managing people through stages of change, all those things that help with engagement uh, throughout the process. So lots to think about, lots to chew on and, and, uh, and hopefully help build out a well-rounded plan uh, for the future. And I will turn it over to Isaac, who's gonna talk about quality. Thanks, Patrick. Next slide, please. So uh, not that we're finished the pandemic, um, but another thing to think about and, and a common theme in this conversation is really leveraging the funding that's available. But I would urge everyone to think about the funding that was available prior to the pandemic and probably throughout uh, from your various pay for performance contracts or, or state programs from any ACOs or, or bundling or other programs that you're currently involved in. A lot of that went on the back burner early in the pandemic, uh, especially as staff transitioned to being remote. And as, as patients were, doing, were seeking care remotely, wasn't always obvious how to keep these programs going. So just things to think about now that may bring back uh, historic or, or bring new revenue streams for your organization. One, the preventative screenings, building registries, doing outreach. If you can do at-home testing, make sure that you know you can send things to your patients and they have the support that they need. Also, any screening that you can embed in your patient portal or other technologies to make sure that you know the patients don't have to come in for it, but you're still providing that high level of quality care. Patrick mentioned the transitions of care. Certainly there's the Medicare TCM program and the chronic care management programs. These are other opportunities where you might get additional reimbursement for services you're already providing and just need to work through the billing and sort of compliance uh, mechanisms surrounding the program. There are other opportunities depending on the state in which you're located. There's the health home program and, and many Medicaid programs as well as collaborative care for your, your integrated care programming. And again, common things that you know, may have happened in February of 2020, but have gone on the back burner. Think about any shared savings programs that you're involved in. Think about your MIPS reporting or your participation in alternate payment models. Look at your health plan contracts. And there may be opportunities for you to drive additional pay for performance payments, and then look at any state incentives. A number of states uh, had PCMH uh, incentives or rewards for maintaining that, and, and you should look at that again, because it's a, a core way to supplement your patient care revenue. I'm now gonna hand it off to David to talk about the sort of capital investment considerations uh, at this time in your planning process. David. Hey, thanks, Isaac. Um, so can move to the next slide, please. So as we saw um, back on one of the early slides, um, fortunately, uh, there's many different sources of funding for, as you think about capital investment. Um, we're really gonna focus today on 
um, the CAD grant code, so the capital investments grant code within the ARP funding. And the reason for that is because, um, you know, the HADF funding while capital investment and capital projects are allowed within in that, that one's a little more straightforward and there's a cap at 500,000 and you can't really leverage that funding. So we're, we're gonna really think about, talk more specifically about on the next few slides, the CAD grant code, the um, capital investment grant code, as it creates a little bit of complexity because um, you are allowed to leverage those funds um, there's guidelines for allowable uses and unallowable uses. So really it creates, as you're thinking about doing capital investment to support the strategic ob objectives that my colleagues have talked about, it really creates kind of a big puzzle. And so we wanna focus on um, what does that puzzle look like and what are some of the tools and approaches and processes to sort of help you plan for and, and sort that puzzle out. So just as a quick reminder, I'm sure all of you have already seen this um, from the HRSA, from HRSA um, but the project types that the capital investment grant can support are construction of a new facility, expansion of an existing facility, uh, alteration and renovation of an existing facility, and equipment only. Um, and so those, those are the broad buckets under which a lot of the capital investment that you'll be thinking about will fall into. Next slide, please. Um, and then there's, this is not an exhaustive list. HRSA was uh, careful to say when they put this list out, um, but it is sort of the main list of unallowable costs. Um, I would say a couple of things. One is that um, later we'll talk about if you have some really, really specific questions related to a project or capital investment that you're working on, that there's um, some specific places you can go to have folks help you um, answer those very specific questions related to your project. Um, the second point I want to make is, you know, this list of unallowable cost really creates this big puzzle that I was just talking about. So keep in mind, um, you know, that for CAD grant code, you can leverage that uh, money. And so each of the sources that you use to leverage that money, whether it's a CDFI loan or the HRSA loan guarantee program, or new market tax credits, or even another grant, whether it's public or private, you're gonna have several sources of funding coming into your project, and each is gonna have their own timing and their own guidelines. So we think, again, today, uh, it's gonna be very important from the beginning, even as you're just starting to conceptualize that project to keep everything straight. And so we wanna talk through some tools, um, a tool in particular, some approaches and qu key questions to ask yourself and then give you some resources so that you can really help yourself to sort that puzzle out. Next slide, please. So just a reminder about the CAD program, um, the amount is $500,000 base amount plus $11 um, per patient. So just using real numbers for a hypothetical health center serving 25,000 patients, that would be a total amount of $775,000. Um, guiding questions. So have you, as you've heard my three colleagues talk about today, we're really encouraging folks to not think about, you know, I have $775,000 from this grant. How can I exactly spend $775,000 in capital investment? But instead to start with, hey, what are my organizational plans and priorities? Um, you know, where are the focus areas where I need investment and, and really start from your plans and priorities and then work backwards to the various sources of capital of which, you know, this CAD grant will be a very important one available to pay for them. Um, we think it's really important um, and we've learned this the hard way um, to fully load your capital project budget with all associated costs. So Far too many times we have health centers come to us, you know, several steps into a project and say, hey, you know, when I was conceptualizing this project, I had a really um, smart and great architect partner. And they really told me that I could count on, you know, I'm, I'm expanding my facility by 10,000 square feet. It's gonna cost 200 bucks a square foot. So my all in cost is $2 million. And so I was budgeting for $2 million and now I'm, I'm figuring out there's all these other associated development costs. So we think it's really important from the beginning to fully load 
that project budget so that you really know and can prepare for the amount of investment that you need to make. And we're gonna show a tool on the next slide that starts to get at that. Um, we always, uh, just, uh, just one more minute on that slide, sorry. We always encourage folks to use a project consultant um, for a large capital project um, and or other supports just because it is a big puzzle. And um, those project consultants actually can often pay for themselves as they can sort of organize that puzzle and get you organized from the beginning and end, end up saving the project money um, as you get into it. And then lastly, as I've said a couple of times, a powerful part of this CAD grant code, uh, this capital investment grant is that you can leverage these grants to invest in all of the priorities that you're setting for your organization. So, you know, CDFI debt is always a source of leverage. New market, new market tax credit program is growing. It's actually growing by, um, it's traditionally a $3 billion annual program and for the next three years will be 5 billion. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of new market tax credit money available specifically. Um, health centers are always a very specifically desirable um, um, client for those for those organizations that have new markets and then obviously there's other grants um, lying as well around as well both public and private next slide please so this is a tool this tool is um, we know very straightforward um, but we also know that it's very important um, I would say from from the very beginning of how you're uh, conceptualizing your project, it's very important to start to plan, A, to fully load your project budget as we talked about before. So thinking through sort of every line item, every different investment that you will have to make to do your capital expansion, but also across the columns to start thinking about what the different sources are um, to fund each of those, those uses. So for example, to use a hypothetical, the C8E grant cannot be used for land purchase and cannot be used for building purchase. So if you know that for your capital project, you're gonna you know, buy a, a shell of a building for half a million dollars, then you'll have to figure out and put in, put in the associated column here, what other source of funding you'll use for that building purchase and then you know, to be able to use this CAD grant um, for construction and construction related expenditures. So we know this tool is straightforward, but we would highly encourage you from the beginning as you're conceptualizing a project to start to think about your full list of capital investment costs in this way um, so that you can keep everything straight. Um, and, and frankly, you can save yourself money if you, if you instead sort of start marching into the project and just say, well, you know, I, if I add up all the sources of funding in my head, but don't really start to allocate them, I know I have enough. We can figure out how to allocate them later. You know, we see clients getting into that situation and then having to pay for extra, very expensive hours for the accountant, very expensive hours for an attorney to sort of start to sort that stuff out. So we think the more organized you can be from the beginning, um, not only will you uh, be able to keep it all straight and have better planning and execution, but we do think you can save yourself money um, over the life of the project. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna talk about one anecdote and this is a real anecdote from a health center that uh, we are talking to. And a point I wanna make is you're gonna hear when you look at HRSA's materials or you talk to other organizations about this, um, about these grant programs, you're gonna hear a lot about how you can't leverage H8F against CAD. So you can't leverage one of the HRSA loan programs against each other. And that's true from a financial perspective, right? So we can't have both H8F capital investment money and CAD capital investment money going into the same capital investment project. But that doesn't mean that you can't strategically leverage the money. And so one client that we're talking to for their H8F grant money is thinking about changing their salary structure. Um, they know they need to pay a little more and have a little bit more um, desirable benefit and incentive structure in order to drive recruitment and retention of staff. And they're also thinking about really for the first time in their history, investing 
uh, a material amount of money in marketing to both drive patient visits and market reputation. And with their CAE money, they're using a state grant that they got, they're leveraging it with CDFI debt and the CAD grant, and they're gonna do state-of-the-art clinic renovations at their main site. Um, and so you can imagine how doing a renovation where you're bringing your clinic up to state-of-the-art standard goes really well with strategically with investments that you're making in marketing and um, investments that you're making in recruiting and retention. So we just wanna, again, encourage you as you're planning and thinking about the future to not let compliance uh, hurdles or guidelines, look at them as sort of like, again, a way, a way, puzzle pieces to fit together so that you can strategically plan and execute um, what's best for your center and your patients over the medium and long term. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So just some quick reminders, uh, materials, um, maybe due to HRSA in, you know, for in the next few months, but the project uh, periods, which you saw in our, our, one of our early really summary slides is the next two to three years. Um, it's unlikely there will be other comparable funding sources. So this is a really unique and timely opportunity. Um, again, we hope that we've reiterated several times throughout, use the funding not only to address your challenges, but really propel your organization forward on plans you had pre-pandemic and or new efforts that improve your access quality and financial resiliency. Um, you know, we had a brief conversation with our friends at NAC on Friday in, in the training and technical assistance group. And they echoed, I would say they echoed this third bullet. They're really encouraging um, centers to bolster their administrative infrastructure and accounting infrastructure um, to be able to absorb and sort of track and use these ARP funds. Um, and they're also encouraging folks to um, think about things like quality and care coordination and really move, really use this investment um, to move toward value-based care and contracting. So I think, um, you know, sort of all of the stakeholders in the industry are, are encouraging clinics to, to think forward and, and um, a dream big, if you will, about how, how you can use this money. And then lastly, we hope that the tools you provided while straightforward um, can really help structure your conversations internally as you start to think about how you're going to prioritize and how you're going to um, uh, put the puzzle together and how you're going to strategically leverage the investments that you're making. Next slide, please. So there's a lot here. There's a lot in this presentation. There's a lot on the HRSA website. You know, there's webinars coming out all the time on these funding opportunities and how folks can plan and execute them. And so we wanted to just provide a pretty a simple list from our perspective of, you know, between now and when you submit, you know, either the H8F grant or the capital grant or after you submit, like who can you call for what? And so if you're thinking about assessing your organization and prioritizing it and planning investments, please call us. Um, we're happy to help you talk through and think through that. Um, if you're thinking about tools and information to prepare you for a capital project, um, call PCDC. We're happy to spend some time with you to um, hopefully elevate what we've seen historically as key risks um, at the front end of a project, or just help you think through some of the big questions you should be asking yourself as you're planning and executing a project. If you have specific, very specific grant-related questions, um, HRSA actually has some really, really good um, materials. I actually watched one of the HRSA webinars myself and found it to be really helpful not only in the information that they provided, um, but also in the sort of places that they point you to, to ask even more specific questions about your particular situation. So again, back to the link on one of the early slides, there's some, there's two particularly good webinars that you can watch about the two, um, the several HRSA grant programs. Um, again, we highly encourage you to think about a project consultant. Um, it is an investment, but it, we've seen time and again that it ends up saving you time and headache. And frankly, you know, you have a full-time job of providing a full-time, very challenging job of providing, you know, high, high quality, comprehensive care, um, you know, real estate development, capital investment. These are sort of um, things that it often makes a lot of sense to get uh, support on. Um, and then again, as you put that puzzle together, 
um, as you start to put that puzzle together, we fully encourage you early to get your accounting and finance team involved um, so that as you're tracking those expenses across those categories, um, you're staying organized throughout and you know making it easier to stay in compliance, making it easier to track your dollars, et cetera. And then again, we know you're doing a lot. We know you were doing a lot before COVID. We know you're doing a lot during and we'll be doing a lot after. So any questions you have on clinical and operational support, um, we're always here to help you think through those as well. Next slide, please. Yeah, so thanks again for your time. Uh, we hope that you found this useful. Um, we want to reiterate that this is not, we're not here for a one-time um, hurrah, like we're around. Please call. Um, we're we know that there's some complexity and this is an important uh, point in planning and executing for the future and we are happy to help. So um, whatever questions you have now, um, we can, um, I think we're going to do a question and answer now and then whatever questions and answers you happen to have after this, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, David. So I guess if anyone has any questions, you can either throw them in the Q&A function in Zoom or you can raise your hand uh, and our colleague Mike can unmute you. Um, Mike, if you go to the next slide, I think that's the one with our email on it. Yeah, it, and if you don't have questions during the webinar, but it, it comes up as a follow-up, you can always reach out to us. PCDC, we're sort of funneling the answers, but We'll work closely with Bonnie and Patrick to make sure you get the, the best possible and, and most efficient response. So I'll give it a minute if there are any questions now. All right. If no questions, 